they welcome you all to Engine Yard. Uh, ben behind us there is the guy working for Engine Yard. Um, we're here for a special uh, February uh, No GS meetup, uh, the top of which is brewing beer with uh, JavaScript powered electronics, uh, which is awesome. Um, for any of you that don't have a beer in your hands, uh, if, if you, if you, as long as, as, long as you, you like, you're not a teetotaler, I'd encourage you to try some beer. There's, there's like, a, a, we, we actually ordered in a bunch of Necroman uh, tonight, so there's a, the official beer of Node.js, we like to call it. <laughs> and there's, there's a brewery that's uh, started down in Waterford, uh, called Necroman Brewery, and they started doing cans of their beer, uh, producing them about a month ago. So we actually got them shipped up, uh, especially for the event. Um, so uh, we have two talks tonight, uh, two people that have flown uh, long distances uh, to come to Dublin and talk here, uh, both of which are passionate about brewing and passionate about electronics. Uh, so uh, the first speaker is Peter Peter. I can't say it. <laughs> <laughs> I can barely speak English, so I can pronounce other things. Um, so P Peter has come all the way from uh, Hungary, yeah, yes. uh, Budapest, uh, to be here uh, to talk about uh, all the crazy brewing stuff uh, that he's, he's doing. And uh, I think the guys from the company as well, you know, as a group, uh, doing stuff with. Yeah, they are helping. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, give, give it up for Peter. Because we would like to produce some carbonation 
uh, when you are home brewing, this is the only way to, have, to add some uh, carbonation to your beer. And after that, if we didn't fuck it, then you can enjoy it. <laughs> and um, is it hard to brew beer? Uh, yes, it is when you don't automate it. Because uh, uh, let me tell about something this. When we first, uh, when we brew beers, and we brew beer the very first time, we did it with a gas heater. You can imagine when you do it outside the gas heater and you have to control the temperature with that, uh, yeah, it's really pain in the ass. But if you automate it, then this process is the best in the beer brewing because you don't have to do anything. Uh, yeah, but um, yes, we automated this temperature level stuff. But uh, I would like to mention that uh, the bottling and other uh, phases are still uh, hard and takes time. Uh, and what's on the technology side? We had new factory. Uh, there is JavaScript everywhere because nowadays you can do everything with JavaScript. Even the hardware part, you can write your database queries, you can write your front end, uh, even the mobile client in JavaScript. A uh, couple of years earlier, you had to know a lot of languages and technologies to do this. So I think it's pretty cool that today you can do all this with one language. Uh, and why Node.js is perfect for this? Uh, it's because the community and because it's extremely moderated, you have all the power of the NPM packages. So you can build your stuff from that. And yes, Node is good for performance as well. And how to start? Uh, if, if you would like to start with IoT and uh, Node.js, I would like to recommend you Johnify, which is um, some people like to call it the jQuery of the IoT. It's a Node.js framework, and as you can see, it's pretty easy to control a servo motor on handle a button uh, click uh, with Johnify. Um, yeah, so I do recommend it uh, to use the first time. But what's uh, behind our system? I already mentioned the tag. Um, from the developer point of view, there are only two three things what is really important for us. Uh, we have two heating elements there, it's uh, 4 kilowatt. We have a temperature sensor, a digital one, and we have relays. We, with the relays we can turn off and on the heating element, and if we do this with the right frequency, we can control the power of the heating element. It's called PWM. Uh, to set the value of the PWM, we also need a circular controlling array that continuously reads the temperature sensor and calculates the output from that. This is called PID. Uh, we are using that. Uh, the PWM and the PID came with uh, some embedded hardware out of the box, but we would like to have some remote controlling and collect some data to the database as well, so we really need an IoT device here. Uh, the first IoT device, what we use, the Brew Factory, uh, was the Raspberry Pi. Uh, if you are not familiar with Raspberry, it's a credit card sized um, microcomputer. It has some ports like USB, Ethernet. It doesn't have built in Wi Fi, but you can extend it with the USB stick, for example. Because it's really a computer and it runs Linux, uh, you can program it in several languages. For example, Python, Node.js, Java, uh, it really depends on you. Uh, but Raspberry doesn't really fit for us, and it's not because of the quality of the product. It, um, okay, let me tell you a story. Um, imagine it's Saturday, the whole thing is together and you are brewing a great new IPA with some special ops. And uh, a power outage happens. It, it can because we are using lots of power for the heating lines. And the SD card of the Raspberry gets corrupted. So we can continue the brew, brewing. And actually, all the ingredients are already in the water. So when it happens and the second time, they decided to block the Raspberry and we move uh, to the Spark core. Uh, probably not compatible in the device. Maybe you heard yesterday the announcement that they start to build a cellular data device. It's pretty interesting. Anyway, it is a bit in Wi-Fi and you can program it C++. But why is it really important? Because it came with the Sparks cloud. Uh, it's an open source cloud uh, implemented in Node.js. And uh, with that, you can iterate with your hardware with REST API and servers and events. And because it's open source, you can deploy your own one production quality service. I think it's 
pretty impressive. Uh, and this is the current architecture of the blue factory, what we do. And it's still not in nice modernized. Uh, and let's see the components. The first, first one, this is the gag, I already mentioned it. The second one, this is the spark device, the IoT device. It has a light ray C connector which communicates with the Spark's IoT cloud. Uh, with number five, this is the Brew Core, this is the Node.js application, uh, which one uh, deployed to Heroku currently, and it provides some interface for the clients, for the Blue UI, which is an isomorphic uh, web client, it's responsive as well, and with number seven, we already have a native iOS client, and we collect some data from the external MongoDB. Uh, Rucor. I mentioned it's implemented in Node.js. It uses Goa, the Eclipse 6 framework to generate us. Uh, it uh, implements, uh, it communicates web sockets with the client, actually. Uh, so this is why uh, it is pretty easy to implement in Node, for example. And it communicates with the sparse cloud. Uh, it's open source, as I mentioned, as every model in the group factor. Oh, sorry, what's the Spark? What is the Spark? Uh, is that from Spark? Sparse cloud? Yeah. yeah um, this is what uh, came out of the box with Spark's IoT device. So it's their service. Um, so if you actually you don't have to build a backend for your application because you can use that one. And um, for example, uh, reading a pin or after reading the data from IoT device or set uh, the pin, you can do this with the REST API uh, course. So. You don't even have to write a backend for this. I think it makes it pretty easy to start with uh, IoT. Yeah, this is the blue core, the uh, brain of the project. And we, I mentioned we have a native uh, mobile client, uh, Blue Mobile. Uh, it's written in Swift, uh, it uses reactive Cocoa and communicates in web sockets. It's written by Agnes, actually, she's sitting over there. Um, yeah, it makes it pretty easier to brew beer from the coffee house, for example. And uh, this is my favorite fun model, Blue UI. Uh, because um, this is a web or web client, and it's written with React and Flux, and it's an isomorphic application. It's uh, written in a node style and uses the common JS model system. Uh, it's bundled to Webpack, but it could be brought with Flux as well, for example. Uh, it's available as NPM model. Uh, but what this isomorphic means, um, actually isomorphic is code sharing between different environments. So for example, your application uh, is able to run on the server side, on the client side as well. Uh, but why is it good for me? Because in this case you can have all the power of the different environments. For example, uh, between the server and the client, you can have the power of the server rendering. So your application will be really probable for the search engines. It's good from the SEO point of view. But you can also support the legacy process um, with the server-side rendering. But because your application runs on the client as well, you can have all the power and speed of uh, single-page applications. So single-page application, for example, Angular. Um, yeah, and uh, how is it implemented in Proof Factory? Um, after the server uh, received uh, the request from the client, um, we have uh, this isomorphic application here, the React Flux application, and we create a new instance from this application below with the initial uh, data. And after that, we serialize the data and we render the DOM to the response and we send it to the client. So when our client receives the response, it will contain the serialized uh, data and uh, the render DOM as well. So when on the client we create a new instance from the same isomorphic application, the same React Flex application, what we use at the server side, you can load the data uh, into the application. So it can continue from the point where the server left it. And uh, because the DOM is already rendered on the server side, um, the client side application will see that it's the same, so it won't render again. Uh, from this point, this application will act like a single page application, so really like Angular application. But we don't have to wait the initial load of uh, the single page application, so it can be really uh, big. And um, I really have only to see size uh, from the isomorphic uh, JavaScript, so sorry, but this is my favorite topic. Um, and about isomorphic challenges, 
Uh, one is the data fetching. I will talk uh, on the next slides about this. Uh, this is an environment specific problem. And another problem is initializing the application because we have to do it both on the server and on the client side. Uh, it can be a hard challenge. And another one is when you add the browser on the client, uh, the environment is singleton. But on the server side, we handle different requests from different users, so we don't have to share uh, data between them when, when we don't want to. Uh, and the data problem. I mentioned the environment specific problem because uh, we should provide the same functionality on the same interface. Um, but it will be really different in the background because on the client side, the data fetching can be an Ajax request or a WebSocket event. But on the server side, it will be a database call to the microservice request. So it will be really different. Uh, I would like to recommend you to talk here from Pete Hunt from the VHS home. It's called Full Stack Flux. It's not really about isomorphic, but it's about how they want to solve this at uh, Facebook. And now it's demo time. How does it look like Rule Factory? Okay, I have to find my good one. This is the interface. You can see the temperature steps here. Um, now it's a more Spark device in the background, so it's not a real device, but uh, it's up like a real. So, um, yeah, when we're heating, then the temperature uh, increase, stuff like that. Uh, this is the PWM, what I mentioned. Uh, this is uh, the actual output of the power. So it's always changing because we would like to keep uh, the 45 uh, degree. Yeah? Um, but why is it interesting? I would like to show... Okay, we also have some logs here, so you can check your previous... Uh, um, but I would like to show this isometric stuff to you. So, let's see this chart, for example, or the design app. Um, let's disable Jalsy. No, it's fully server rendered. But it's still working. Of course, it's not, uh, not responsive because that is no JavaScript, but it's SVG graph, so it's rendered on the server side. And uh, because it can work without uh, JavaScript, uh, it's scrollable and it can support the legacy browsers as well. Uh, in this case, of course, uh, the NCHOS app uh, doesn't, it, actually, JavaScript didn't catch uh, the links. So it's, it will be really a request to the server. So it's still working. Of course, we don't have PWM data because we don't have WebSockets with the jealousy. But let's enable it. So when I hit enable, it's much, much faster because it's a single page application now. You can check here in the network uh, panel that when I select another one, uh, Brew, it really communicates in a pure data because it's a single page application. Sir, what did you enable there? Uh, the JavaScript, JavaScript support. I disabled the uh, earlier. So maybe it's uh, okay, maybe I should. No, I can zoom, but maybe here I can I remember right. Yes. So now when it's a single page application, it's okay, now it's disabled. So you can see it really communicates. Uh, it's a response from the server, it's, it's an HTML response, yeah, here as well. That's one kind of JavaScript. Because it's a single page application, we don't load the templates again, we load only the few data. Okay, back to the presentation. Actually, it was the last. Slide, I guess. Okay, so only if you like the project and the technologies, what we use, then please join and continue. It would be really great. And uh, thank you for your attention.